you know, Ukrainians don't hate Russian people. Ukrainians, Did you think Russia was actually going to invade? Knows it for so many people, it's been the worst week of their lives. What were you taught about Russia growing up? Like, did you? We don't need another conflict. We don't need another war. Nobody wants. Nobody wants this war. Hello, everyone. I'm Kat, a conflict analyst with a vision for inspiring peace. Many of you have been watching the conflict situation unfold in Ukraine. Already over a million people have fled the country. Another important aspect of the conflict is its impact on Ukrainians who were already living abroad when the recent invasion happened. So today I'm pleased to welcome a special guest, my cousin Spas Natalia, who currently lives in Chicago but is originally from Ukraine. Natalia, thank you so much for joining us today during this incredibly difficult time. Hi, how are you? Thank you for having me. So Natalia, can you tell me a little bit about your background? <clears throat> sure. First 20 years of my life, I lived in Ukraine. I moved to the States in the beginning of 2016. And since then, I've been here. Most of my family uh, in Ukraine, most of my friends are still there. I'm sure that I'm not alone in saying that some days you don't know what is worse, being there or being here and just feeling hopeless and feeling like you can't do much regarding, you know, everything. Of course. Um, yeah. Is there a big Ukrainian community where you live now in Chicago? The way I like to say it is there's a big Ukrainian community, but there's also in general a big Russian speaking community. Okay. Okay. There are a lot of people from Central Asia, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, and people from all over the world who speak Russian. And Chicago has a number of big churches, stores, Ukrainian restaurants. Yeah. A lot of people who move here, they don't speak fluent English. So it's definitely very nice to have that comfort zone where you can start, when you can be with your people and they're going to help you. I, uh, myself, I never, I never lived in Ukrainian village, but it is a comfort, especially in a times like this. It's definitely feels appealing to be with my people and go there. And, um, I'm planning my trip actually tomorrow. Maybe we're going to stop in a church, stop by in a couple of stores because even supporting Ukrainian business in that small way is already, you know, it feels important buying Ukrainian products, knowing that these people have families in Ukraine and, Mm -hmm. or some of their family members recently arrived or planning to arrive. It, it just feels important to go and support my people. For sure. How, how has the crisis been affecting Ukrainians abroad and you and your community particularly? Um, personally, I keep saying that it's been one of the worst. It's on this point over a week. Today is day number 10. If I'm not mistaken, I was at work when I got a message from my family just saying that it started and I was almost done with work, but I just kind of froze and I kind of like started crying, but also I was working and I wasn't sure if I should go home, but I also didn't really want to talk any to anybody about it. And it was just so many, so many feelings. It, it's... Uh, I know that for so many people, it's been the worst week of their lives. Thankfully, some of my family members, they made it out of country. Some of my friends, they made it out of country, but still majority of people I know, I care about, um, they're there. And um, first, thing, first thing in the morning, I check my phone and making sure that I don't have any messages from my family, that I don't have any messages from my friends, because I know that if anything would happen, they would let me know right away. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that so many people waking up and going to bed pretty much doing the same thing. And um, yeah, it's it's really hard. It's really hard mentally. It's hard to, you feel guilty when you're happy in a way. I, I haven't feel happy this last 10 days for more than a minute because when I have a nice meal or when, I, when it's beautiful outside and I go on a walk or take mm -hmm. our dog out or yeah. do whatever, enjoy my life. Uh, first thing that comes to my mind is that I can do it, but all of those people can't, and they just could, like a week ago. 
but now they can't. And it, this feeling is just, it doesn't leave you. And I don't think it's gonna leave any Ukrainian person or not only Ukrainian person until all of it is over. I keep saying that you don't need to be Ukrainian or have family or friends in Ukraine to be affected by it mm-hmm. because this is, um, it's, it's a world issue because we're all humans and it, it's yeah. as much as it is on Ukrainian and Russian level in the first place, it's on a human level. The amount of people that, go, that are already traumatized and yeah. will be traumatized and gonna stay traumatized from what happened is just yeah. so many people. Wow, that's a lot. <clears throat> <laughs> So you said you came to the States in 2016. What what prompted you to venture abroad from Ukraine at that time? So originally my first visit to States was in 2015 for three months period. I was a student back in Ukraine and I was a part of a program for students from all, all over the world. I went back home and back in 2015, things were already kind of like tense in Ukraine because of Revolution of Dignity or Maidan mm-hmm. that uh, started in 2014. So thinking about it now, when I came back here one year later in 2016, I decided that I will try to stay in States and I will try to start building my life here. It was definitely impacted by me realizing that the conflict is not going to be over anytime soon, even though... Okay. You know, I was a young person, 19 years old. <laughs> My brother, he was a part of Ukrainian military. So we had a lot of awareness what is going on my family. So there are things that you love sometimes, but you don't like. And that's the way I felt about Ukraine back then. I always love my country, mm-hmm. but... I didn't like the government and I just, you know, looking at all of the young people and how hard it is for them to build their lives, you know, do all all of the things they want to do, do all all of the things they're passionate about and be comfortable. It just didn't seem easy. So that's kind of what was my motivation, you know, back then. Wow. So, so I think for a lot of people, they hear about the crisis that's happening in Ukraine. And they're like, oh no, this is happening right now. But in your experience, this has been ongoing tensions that impacted you. In, in, in every Ukrainian's experience, the conflict started in 2014. Things we're talking about today, people compare it to Third World War. Mm-hmm. Uh, definitely, it wasn't the same way back then. But if we talk about Ukrainian people and their experience, I'm sure that everybody's going to tell you that it didn't start this year. It started back in 2014. So after 2014, did tensions ever really die down in your lived experience? So I think that I feel like the thing that is confusing a lot of people who are not as familiar is that, you know, since 2014, if you go travel to Ukraine, if you go to Kiev later on, not directly in 2014, but uh, if you go in certain places, in certain cities in Kiev, uh, in Ukraine, you won't know that there is a war. You won't know that there is a conflict because people keep living and enjoying their lives and, you know, just keep going. And the thing is that tension was specifically in a couple of cities, okay. uh, not the whole country the way it is right now. And that's kind of like, I feel like a lot of people were confused in a way yeah. because it wasn't the whole country that was involved. It was specific regions. Yeah, as I said, 2014 was definitely a moment in um, Ukrainian history when uh, things started changing and for forever, (laughs) you know. What were you taught about Russia growing up? Did you ever visit Russia? Did you? Uh, Yeah, um, I've been in Russia a couple of times. Russian language is the second language in Ukraine. Everybody I know speak Russian. And um, I grew up speaking both languages. Uh, we had Russian language as a subject in school, but even if we didn't have it as a subject in school, it just 
everywhere. We were so connected that I can't even answer this question what I was taught about Russia because somebody speaks Russian, somebody speaks Ukrainian, somebody speaks both. My experience was I would switch pretty much every day depending who I'm talking to, you know. The reality is that uh, post-Soviet Union's countries language was Russian, not Ukrainian. So obviously like every country has their own culture and traditions and values. But in the end of the day, I personally don't think about Russian language as being only language that belongs to Russia. I think about Russian language uh, as a tool for all of those people who speak Kyrgyz, Kazakh, Polish, anything, you know, and they still have language that they can connect. We were never, we were never enemies. We're not, we're not the same people, but it doesn't, as, as our president said, you know, even, even if we're not the same people, we're different people, it doesn't mean that we need to be enemies. Yeah, what we were taught about Russia is that we are brothers. <laughs> that's what we were taught. And that's... Oh, okay. So, because I, you know, I think a little bit what I was wondering about with all the tensions, did you have some kind of feelings of animosity growing up against Russia? Or it sounds like it was very much an interconnected cultural exchange. Not at all. That's why on so many levels, what is going on right now, it's just absurd. There's so many families that are Russian, Ukrainian families and speak all of the languages. So many people who move to Ukraine or from Ukraine to Russia. And there's so many connections and relationship. And it's really sad that the message was sent to the world is if brother can attack brother and nobody would ever assume this would happen, then what about other countries? If they are attacking the country who is the closest, then what we can think about other countries who are further. It's... Um, yeah, the, the implications all across the world. There are a lot of, there are a lot of layers, you know, yeah. there, are, there are a lot of layers and it's really, it's really sad. You know, I don't hate Russian people and, um, you know, Ukrainians don't hate Russian people. Ukrainian, Ukrainians hate Russian president. As anywhere, there are good people, there are bad people, there are people with different opinions. So there are definitely people who are, I don't want to say support in support of the war, but I do want to say in support of a president who made it happen. Right. So, um, and there are people who are, don't understand what's going on. Um, so as Ukrainians, and it just seems like a nightmare to them, yeah. you know. So I don't, I don't want to send a message like Ukrainian people and Russian people are enemies. Ukrainian people and Russian government are enemies. And, um, you know, I don't, you know, when you, when, you, when you read how many people died, you know, it doesn't make me feel good when I see that there are more Russians who died. I, see, I look at it as somebody's brother died, somebody's dad died, somebody's son died. I don't care, you know. Mm -hmm. whose side it was yeah. because nobody because nobody wanted so i know that you know relationship is never going to be the same and this is very it's it's very sad like <laughs> yeah it sounds like apart from just the violence happening right now just the the breach of cultural connection yeah just you know the way it happened and just to, to the extent it happened, even people who have the same opinion as I am, like we don't have hate Russians, it's really hard to stay on track of um, being a human after all, after everything <laughs> that you witness and all of the news you see and all of the lives that all of the lives we lost. When Russia's military started amassing troops outside Ukraine this spring, did you think Russia was actually going to invade? It, it was hard, you know, because because as much as I hoped it won't happen, I had a feeling that it, w it will happen just because we're talking about Putin. If you're going to do some research, uh, how many countries Russia affected uh, since he uh, became a president, you're going to realize that it was always the same strategy. And, and again, I'm not even a person who knows so much about politics. It's just because... He's the person who is in charge of that. And it is absurd. So it is understandable, you know, why so many people didn't believe that it's going to happen. You know, we need to understand that uh, we have a person who's been in power um, over 20 years. And you no, know, tw 20 years is enough time to brainwash a big amount of people. And yeah. that's why informational war is a real thing. And that's what we've been witnessing 
all of these years because when you have channels that you owe or people who work for you who owe channels, what people are gonna see on TV? What messages are they gonna get? They're gonna get whatever message you wanna send them because you're in that power and you've been in that power long enough. Information, informational war affecting everything and how just incredibly powerful it is, so. If you had a channel, if you had a way to communicate to the Russian people, apart from this whole disinformation and censorship, what would what would you want the message to be? So the message is check the information, get curious, <laughs> think about if it was your country, think about what you would do. Ukrainian people gonna forgive you if you're gonna try, you know. Ukrainian people forgive soldiers, Russian soldiers who go there and give up. They don't kill them, they feed them and give them shelter. They don't beat them, they respect them because they understand that these people made a choice to put their guns down. There is information that maybe these people didn't make a choice to come and invade, but when they were already there, when they made it there, they had a choice to put their gun down or not. And if they did, in the end of the day, they won't receive hate. But if they didn't, then, you know, yeah. what happens that happens and nobody can judge them. So, wow. because nobody wants, nobody wants this war. Yeah. Other than one specific person. Nobody wants it. Nobody needs it. Mm -hmm. Nobody cares in the end of the day, you know, whose side going to lose more people because in the end of the day, it's also just people and yeah we don't we don't need this there's so much bad in the world we don't need another conflict we don't need another war absolutely thank you for sharing those thoughts it's really of course inspiring and profound <laughs>
you know, I would say, you know, you don't need to do something you never done or you don't need to be anybody else uh, to support. You know, being in culinary industry and seeing how chefs all around the world just kind of like getting together and cooking for Ukraine, just kind of donating money. You don't even need to make a Ukrainian dish to donate money and send to Ukraine. It can be any dish, right? Or oh, contacting your representative to express your support. Again, if you, if you, if you see uh, protests in your city, in your town, join even just Posting, reposting stuff is also helps because again, more people do that. The less, the less power, you know, our informational uh, <laughs> enemies have. Yeah. Um, obviously, there's a way to donate money, but also there's so many organizations and volunteers that even if you're not in a good financial situation, you can always just kind of go and help pack packages. You know, there's so many things you can do. If you owe a business, there's so many businesses stop working with Russia. If you owe a business, I can't tell you who to work with, but kind of up to you. But again, if you, you are empowered to do something like that, you always can. Yeah. Anything would help really. Everything from prayers to financial support to reposts and protests and checking information. If you know some Ukrainian people, you know, how can people best check in with their friends and neighbors who are Ukrainian in a way that doesn't completely drain them? You know, it's, it's, it's a good question. I just think that people who care, I just think that you should understand that these people are going through a lot right now. Mm-hmm. And it's important to give them space to yeah. speak when they want to speak and just let them be when they just want to be. So many people reached out to me, even people I didn't talk to in years, just kind of asking, Mm -hmm. how is my family? How are my friends? Obviously, there's so much attention and everybody want to know. Yeah. And, you know, I'm sure everybody appreciates those questions, but it also takes so much energy just because I kind of need to put myself together again. For sure. After every conversation, you know. So, again... Make sure you give people those moments, that space. Don't have any hard feelings if people don't respond right away and take their time to respond. I think that's a great piece of wisdom. So thank you very much for that, Natalia. Thank you so much for tuning in to listen to Natalia's story today and hear about the resilient spirit of people in Ukraine. Today, let's honor that strength and together, let's light a candle for the Ukrainian people. Let's take a moment to welcome our neighbors from around the world with kindness hold the Ukrainian people in our thoughts, as well as all the people around the world who have been displaced by violent conflict, Syria, Afghanistan, Yemen, Somalia, South Sudan, Eritrea. The power for peace is in our hands. There are billions of people around the world. If we all stand for peace, we will be standing together. Natalia, thank you so much for opening up your heart and sharing with us today. Thank you for having me. For those of you listening, how do you feel after hearing Natalia's powerful words? I know I feel a lot more hope about the possibility for peace. One thing that struck me the most was you don't have to change everything in your life. You do something with what you have right now. What do you have? What power do you have to speak up for peace in the world? Thank you again for joining me. Peace.